Hello, good morning. Welcome to Joy News. That's where coming to you live from our studios in Kokomlimi. Coming up this morning, your integrity will be established. That's according to President Ekofoado as he accepts Sanitation Minister's resignation. We'll probe into those comments by the President and also find out whether Cecilia that passed the resignation exonerates her from any wrongdoing. Also this morning, beginning August, all babies born in Ghana would be issued with Ghana card numbers as well as their birth certificate identification numbers. The work has been completed and the test, the full test was done yesterday. And I'm happy to say that the first baby with a Ghana card number was issued yesterday. We have more as he announces that the first Ghana card for a baby has been issued. Las Farmers in Kari and Gorogo in the Talensi district of the Upper East region are calling on government to hold contractors back to fix their one village one down. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. We're coming to you live also on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram and Twitter. Join us on TV. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. Please stay for details. President Ekofuado is expected to appoint a new sanitation minister as a replacement for Cecilia Benadapa. This follows the resignation of the latter hours when news broke that her house help had stolen cash worth over $1 million, which she had stashed in her Abilinkbe residence. In his acceptance comments to the former sanitation minister, the president said he believes the integrity of, the, uh, of Madame Cecilia Dapa will be established. Well, anti-corruption campaigners have since described the comments as feeding into the perception that the president is a clearing agent for his appointees perceived to be engaged in corrupt acts, particularly at a time when the public servant is in question is yet to face any legal institution or body for investigations. In addition, Cecilia Dapa has resigned and has assured her preparedness to avail herself for any public inquiry. Here on News Desk, we will ask, does this put the matter to rest? To what extent does the president's comment influence any future probe into the saga? Professor Bafwa Jumendria is former UN advisor on governance. He joins us with more. Prof, I'm grateful for your time. Let me first find out from you, does her resignation put the matter to rest? This incident evoke all kinds of sentiments uh, regarding the way our resources have been managed over the years by government. And this particular case, I think, uh, is a fine opportunity, in my humble view, for government, for the president in particular, to highlight the need for public officers to put up the best uh, conduct when they are in office. And I think uh, the resignation the right thing, uh, the minister took the right step, and I personally like the idea and commend her for offering to cooperate fully with agencies that may be investigating this particular case. So I think we have a long way to go for her to establish her credibility, to regain her integrity, and then that will put the matter to rest. But until the investigations are concluded, um, I don't think uh, this is putting it to rest at all. Of the president's uh, comments that he believes that her integrity will be proven. Uh, I think that's a bit premature, again, my humble view. Because, you see, when a case is under investigation, as I think should be, besides the court uh, uh, proceeding with the complaint uh, of the loss of the money, I think uh, these are cases where, if I were the president, I'll be a little bit more careful. The president was right in commending her for the job she's done for the government and for the nation as a whole. Because truly, Madame Cecilia Dapa has been a, a worthy public servant. There's no doubt at all in my mind. But when a case of this nature emerges, it's important for the processes to take place before we jump to conclusions. 
That is why I would even caution all the public commentators to be able to take second place. Because look, there's no evidence so far that it's a stolen money. There's no evidence so far that it is a laundered money. We don't have any evidence. All we know is that he sent some people to, to the police for stealing her money. Of course, it's the, it's the amount of the money that is causing this kind of public uproar. But once nothing has been established, we should not condemn them. But I think what we need to do is to ensure that the proper investigation processes take place. For instance, uh, I think Yoko should be interested because there could be an angle of this money being laundered. I'm not saying it is, but it raises that question. The Office of Special Prosecutor must be interested because, again, it raises issues of uh, corruption. Even Shrek may be interested because he could raise the case of administrative injustice in terms of how things are done. And I'm not making this point to say he is guilty, not at all, but just for her to regain her integrity. If these processes take place, she will be able to regain that. That's why I think it was premature for the president to make a conclusive statement that he's confident that uh, her integrity will restore. We haven't gone through the process yet. And that, for me, was a little bit unfortunate. <laughs> Sorry. Um, w will people be right if they say the president is a clearing agent for his appointees who are um, suspected to be corrupt? Frankly, I don't know about that. People can make their own comments. I will not make that comment. But what I can say is that the president seems to be consistent in apparently denying any wrongdoing of his appointees. That seems to be consistent. <coughs> because for me, this would have been a wonderful opportunity to stand tall by taking a certain stand. While commending her for her great services to the nation, it could be an opportunity for the president to reiterate uh, the, the, his, his position on this whole notion of corruption and thievery and all. Not saying the lady is guilty, not at all. We don't know that. But for the president not to take that stance, not, be, not be, to be a little bit more aggressive in uh, making a bold statement on the need for public officials to conduct themselves well, I think he misses the boat on that. All right? So, as I say, uh, uh, it's not that, hey, Madame Dapa, look, this woman has worked for many years. I know that personally. And before he, he got into this government, she ran a business. Her husband at the time is also a business person. But the whole idea of a public official keeping that amount in the house is what is causing this to happen. Maybe in the end, when the proper processes are done, it will uh, emerge victorious in, in terms of finding uh, nothing against it. And I think that's what those of us who know her pray for. Nonetheless, if it is found out that he breached certain rules and all, then sanctions might be imposed. Is if you're a leader, you got to be bold in taking certain decisions that reinforce the kind of image you want to present to your people. That's why I think people are saying he's a, he's a, he's a clearing house. I don't believe so. But I can say that he's been very consistent in not damning any appointee who allegedly may have committed some kind of uh, offense. And that's what my problem with him is. Picture then that her conduct and that of the president paint as far as good governance is concerned. You see, if you take this country, the present conditions of the country into account, how some people have lost their, their money investing in government's own bank, how the economy it's kind of uh, grounding down when people uh, we are experiencing all these kind of things. If I'm in government, I'll be very careful about these things, about money, its usage, and its storage. Okay? Because the reason why people are up in arms, and I believe, many may believe that, the money is a very decent woman. I know that, as I keep saying. So probably it's, a, it's a, a matter of indiscretion on her part and her husband's part who have stored that money uh, uh, in the house. Probably uh, confident the banking system is dropping so people want to hold their money. There are all kinds of possible reasons. And in fact, one can even agree that traditionally, and I know it's uh, from uh, Asante, people like to keep money, you know. But nonetheless, 
when you are a public official, your behavior might be distinctively different from a private person. If a certain private businessman had $10 million in the house, he stole it, and he came out, I don't think the uproar will be as great as we are having it right now. Okay? And I think that's where our public officials are missing. They are missing something. They forget that even if you're a public official and you're a millionaire before becoming a public official, immediately you take the oath to serve the nation, everything changes. See, that's why you remember when Dr. Kosin Dion decided to get into public office. He announced publicly that he was divorcing himself from his business so that there will be no iota of a, a conflict of interest. That is the way to do So rich people can go into government, but certain measures are taken to separate your new role from your own role. So I guess the point I'm making is that even if the, the Madame Cecilia Dapa money is legitimate, he had it, you know, before he didn't get into government. The fact is that his present position expected her to, to behave better in terms of how she's managing his own private affairs. Prof. Bafaji Mandri, I'm grateful for your time. He's former UN advisor on governance. Meanwhile, MP for Tamale Central, Ibrahim Motala Mohammed, says President Ekofado's comment seeking to clear former sanitation minister Cecilia Dapa is unfortunate and does not signal a true effort at fighting corruption. President Ekofado, in accepting the resignation of minister, indicated has strong confidence in the minister that she will be exonerated of any wrongdoing. Speaking to Joy News, Ibrahim Motala Mohammed argued that the president was already seeking to clear the minister even before an investigation. Let's get more from parliamentary affairs correspondent Kweku Asante, who has joined us. Kweku Motala Mohammed is concerned that so many more ministers may be hoarding money in their homes. In fact, he has very strong words. President Kufuado, who he accused of being a clearing agent, he says the president should wait for proper investigation to happen into these allegations that have been made against the minister. In fact, he says that despite the minister's allegation or claims that there are consistencies in the reports that have been put out so far, the minister has not proven any contrary figures to this effect. He says that it is the belief of the minority that the president is only seeking to do what he normally do when there's corruption allegation against his ministers to clear them. He's also alleging, for instance, that if you see the amount of money involved that has been said to have been stolen from Madame Cecilia Dapa, it will mean that more ministers are even hoarding more cash because these are money they gain from corrupt or illicit proceedings, for which reason they cannot lodge in the bank. He says that contrary to the government's claim and almost always calling on Ghanaians to actually not hoard the foreign currency, especially the dollar, his understanding is that a lot more ministers are doing so. And in fact, he says that the Public Accounts Committee must take some keen interest in this and look in. Well, Kukwa Sanchez is a parliamentary affairs correspondent. Kukwa, if you can hear me, we know that a Public Accounts Committee is sitting this morning. Has this issue come up and what else uh, can you report from there? Well... Well, Kwasante, we know that, that the Public Accounts Committee is sitting. Has this issue come up? So the, 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 the minister's ministry is expected to appear. Right, so Beautiful. there's... It's a terrible connection with the network. Definitely there's more we'll be bringing you from Parliament. Uh, in our subsequent bulletins. Move on to other stories. Some Irish youth of Asokore Mampong in Kumase have vandalized Asawasu police station following the alleged killing of a young man by police Sunday evening. The youth claimed 32-year-old Silaiha Talifo, who was arrested in a police swoop in the area, was manhandled by the police leading to his death. Louver blades of windows and benches at the station were destroyed by the youth who pelted stones and other materials at the station. Nanaya Ojima joins us uh, with details. Um, Nanaya, wh what more can you tell us about the attack uh, by the youth on the police station in Asawase? Nanaya, what more can you report from Asawase? Yes, thanks, sir. 
So information that we got last night is that uh, a youth, uh, a section of groups, uh, youth from the Akrama community visited the Afonas police station to protest the alleged killing of their colleague by the police. According to them, the colleague was arrested in a police suit at Asquare Mampong. And we understand that the um, youth group are claiming that the police handled the young man leading to his demise. So yesterday they went to the police, fell to stones at the police station and got access into the police station. And it took intervention of a police patrol team to get to the station and ensure that calm is restored. We learned that some of the policemen who were in the police station could were able to run uh, for, for, for to save themselves from attack being attacked by these young men. Um, yesterday we tried to get access to the police and get their side of the story, but unfortunately um, the officers that we were able to establish contact with said they cannot talk. They write a report, send it to the police in Accra, that's the headquarters, for them to issue a statement on what is happening. So they are unable to tell us their side of the story, but um, we know that calm has been restored. The person who has been, who, who died from um, a, a alleged police manhandling, was, uh, the body was deposited at the Confanati Teaching Hospital. This morning we've been able to establish contact with some family members of the deceased and um, we learned that they are trying to get the body of the deceased for barrier since they are Muslims immediately something like of this nature happens. They try to um, within the shortest possible time find a barrier place for the deceased. So police from our investigation have commenced their investigation into the matter and in due time we're expecting that police will issue a press statement um, explaining what went down at the Afonas police station. And now, Jim, with that update from Asawase, we have our eyes on this matter. Definitely will bring you more as and when we get updates from there. Now, beginning August, all babies born in Ghana will be issued with Ghana card numbers as well as their birth certificate identification numbers. That's a revelation by Vice President Dr. Baumia. This follows the completion of the integration of the database of the Ghana Health Service, the Bets and Deaths Registry, and the National Identification Authority leading to the first baby in Ghana being issued with the Ghana card number. Speaking at the 75th speech and prize given day of the Ghana National College in Cape Coast, Dr. Baumia revealed that nearly 90% of the population now have their tax identification numbers and the nation is on course in digitalizing the economy. Speaking at the 75th anniversary of the school, the vice president indicated that government was working deeply to ensure that all facets of the Ghanaian economy is digitalized. He says Ghana's economic transformation is inextricably linked with the digitalization of the economy. When we came into office, only 4% of the population had tax identification numbers. We said make the Ghana card the tax identification number, and now we have 85% of the population with tax identification numbers. I am very happy to announce here, and I think this is the first time, uh, because it just happened yesterday, we wanted to make sure we would be able to issue Ghana card numbers to children when they are born, right? And we have therefore integrated the databases of the National Identification Authority with the Births and Deaths Registry and the Ghana Health Service. Uh, the work has been completed and the test, the full test was done yesterday. And I'm happy to say that the first baby where a Ghana card number was issued yesterday. So you are entering into a world from next month, from next month, all babies born in Ghana, once they take them to weigh in, weigh in they will be issued the Ghana card number and also they will be, because of, they will also get the birth certificate.
Let's get down to the rest of our stories. The Social Security and National Insurance Trust, NIT, says it will urgently review its investments to assure maximum productivity. Members of the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament have been questioning leadership of the Trust on some of the investment decisions they make which have not yielded profits to pay contributors. Speaking to journalists, Director General of SNAID, Dr. John Oferitinkran, explained that the Trust is currently reviewing its investment portfolio and will always channel its resources where it can get maximum gains. As the, our minister said, uh, it's about time we look at some of the uh, economically targeted investments that have been made in the past um, and have a policy that makes sure that we enter into uh, investments which are going to give a return to the, to the, to the trust. So um, we, we took that, we've taken that on board and I'm sure that uh, over time, the portfolio will be streamlined so that we don't have uh, any of these uh, so-called socially targeted investments that have a tendency not to perform. Uh, we've made significant progress from where we were the last time we appeared. Uh, a lot of these uh, investments that need a bit of uh, restructuring and cleanup, uh, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, we, we actually accept the admonition from the chairman that uh, uh, the funds that come to us are pensioners, uh, are contributory funds where people are hoping that they get put into good use so that it will be, will be ready to pay their pensions. And we've, we've taken that in, in good order and that is exactly what we are committed to do and we are going to do that. Dr. Semkran also revealed that government's domestic debt exchange program has not affected a trust in any way that will prevent it from honoring its obligations to pensioners. With respect to the DDEP, let me address that first. I think the good news there for pension funds, not only for SNET, but for pension funds in general, is that uh, the government uh, uh, exempted us. So for those of us who hold uh, government bonds, um, we haven't uh, suffered any losses in respect of uh, haircuts or anything like that. Um, yes, SNIT as an investment, as, a, uh, as part of our investments, we do invest in other companies who are exposed to the DDEP, uh, especially the banks. Uh, so that is an indirect effect there. But, uh, it is not something that is material that, that would prevent us from honoring our obligations. We are committed to make sure that we are making good investments. And um, I think I want to assure uh, contributors and pensioners that, you know, as much as one cannot predict what the investment landscape is going to be like, we make sure that we are putting the necessary checks and balances in place to manage our risk and to make sure that on a risk-adjusted uh, basis, we post good returns for the contributor. In the Upper East region, farmers in Kari and Gurugu in the Talense district are calling on government to hold contractors back to fix their one village, one dam. They say the dams are too important to be abandoned in their current state. They want the basing of the dams deepened, the embankment walls firmed up, and the area of the dam widened. Jojo Kobna has more in the Jury News hotline documentary, Testy Dams. We are not happy. We can't farm. Our land is just bare. We would have been farming during Christmas. You must repair the dam for us. We had no idea the dam would be constructed like this. We thought they would do a good job. We farm on this land we gave away for the dam and we were excited because we hope it will help us. They came here to help us by constructing the dam so that we can farm all year round and make money. But the dam dries up so fast, you will not even recognize the site as a dam. I planted in the first year and the water dried up, so my plants died. 
The farmers say they will not count it as a loss if the government brings back contractors to reconstruct the dam. Some pledged to support the government to clinch to power if the dams are properly constructed. I pray the contractor comes back to the site to construct it the way we want. If our dams are well constructed, we will support you always. We are waiting for the rain before we plant. Without rain, we can't plant. Where is the water that we will use to farm during the dry season? This part of the story is called waiting for rain. The one village one dam policy was meant to put an end to rain-fed agriculture. The government hoped that just as people in Burkina Faso farmed all year round and even exported tomatoes to Ghana, people in the northern region would be able to do the same. Unfortunately, the people of Gorogo farm only during the rainy season. It is the main reason why the assemblyman for Gorogo, Roland Basama, is refusing to call the project a dam. And his reason is... Actually, we don't call this one a dam. This is a dark out. Well, the closure of the Bwepi share nut factory in the Savannah region is said to be affecting share business in the area where the product known as the Northern Cocoa is largely found. The $10 million factory joint venture between the Produce Buying Company Limited and Messrs. LDS uh, Macrinas Equipmentos Industries Limited of Brazil was established to process share nuts into share butter, share oil, among others, for export to Brazil. But the factory has been closed for the past four years, pushing a lot of people into the market and uh, its effect is affecting their livelihood. The factory, now outgrown with weeds, was once a vibrant site which boomed with activities. The place is now very quiet with only the sound of chirping birds and the movement of animals. The only visible human you will see at the factory is the security guard who is to ensure the machines are protected. The factory that once bought share from the people in the area now sits in the bushes idling. The assemblyman for all Bupe electoral area, S. Winnie Williams, said share they picked the previous years are sitting uncollected, making the people poorer each day. When PVC was in progress, there's nothing like coming to me for support. But people were getting what they wanted. Because their duty is to pick and they will come and buy. Money, food, everything was just in abundance. Now, you get to my village and see. People pick down China since last year. No one stepped there to pick them. The five regions of the north, which are largely known as the poor regions of Ghana, the factory was to turn things around considering the global demand for share butter. But that hope is dashed. Yakubu Fatima, who picked share, said they are forced to sell at very low prices, or you may have to process it for home consumption. With this stress that you go through, the only benefit is when you use it to make share butter for the family. But if you want to sell it, your profit is just marginal. What they do is they just come and buy at cheap prices. Madame Idisa Aramata buys share from the villages and resells. She said 
in the past, she would present it to the factory and take her money instantly. But currently, she has to travel several kilometers to Tamale and even sell it at cheaper prices. <laughs> In the past, when I go around the villages and buy, I go to the factory and they pay me instantly. But now I have to travel to the Tamale market and sell. And the buyers will buy it at a very cheap price. At the Abuabu market, share not sellers want government to pay more attention to the produce because of its important value around the globe the price have gone down completely and yet there is such struggle in getting the nuts now the value of the share is even more than the cocoa with share nuts you can get oil use it for soup pomade making of chocolate among others Therefore, these uses are many, yet the price has gone down completely. Therefore, we are calling on government to intervene. The closure of the factory is not only affecting people working in the share value chain, but also the youth of Bupe who were largely employed at the factory. Abdullah Baki, Assemblyman for the Bupe Electoral Area, wants government to intervene and do to revive the company so that their youth in that particular in savannah region will get something doing because uh, government made a pledge of giving every district a factory and fortunately we were already having an existing factory in uh, yapeku Sego constituency so if they were if the government were even to give another factory it was going to be a plus for the millions of people in the share value chain, what they are asking is that government pay attention and revamp the factory to, to create jobs and income for the teeming unemployed youth in the area. For Joy News, Martina Bugri reporting. Joy News Impact Makers Award winner for the Bono region, Jefferson Christia Gbotro, says the future of the country depends on how children are empowered to identify the prospect and the life choices they make. Speaking during a child empowerment program for selected basic school students in Sunyai, organized by the Friends of Health Association, Ms. Agbatro said the project would help build the confidence of the children to sustain the development of the nation. Precious Semevo. The future of every nation depends on the choices of the younger generation. Your future is, all, is in your own hands. You can protect that future, you can hold that future by studying very hard. Friends of Health Association, FOHA, led by Joy News Impact Makers Award winner for the Bono region, Jefferson Kwesiak Botro, is helping to change the narrative by engaging basic school students in the Sunyani municipality to build their confidence in identifying prospects in their life choices. Students from the Norbert Educational Complex at Yaoima and Assemblies of God Schools in Sunyai were exposed to the causes and effects of drug abuse and teenage pregnancies, mentorship, career guidance, and menstrual hygiene education, among others. We are telling them to ensure that they do not become victims of teenage pregnancy, victims of drug abuse, they do not become victims of child marriage. And when we have these young ones going to school, it means that they are going to become productive, they are going to work, and their dependency ratio or unemployment rate by extension in years to come is going to reduce. So I was motivating and empowering them that it's possible. The future is full of possibility, and they just have to stay focused until they get there to make greater impact in their generation. Some of the teachers said the empowerment drive deserve commendations. I would like to acknowledge him for his boldness. Also, his know-how about how children should position themselves in doing things. Ghana is turning to um, a country where um, youths find themselves in a situation whereby they don't know what to do. For him to take upon um, himself to, 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 to organize such a thing, I think he should be applauded even more than this. For her hopes to empower over 2,000 children, a project Mr. Gotro said requires the support of stakeholders to help children make the right choices today to impact their future and the country tomorrow. We need to go to 
the hental and the heart to rich areas. And then you need transport to carry volunteers there. And then we also need some, uh, the menstrual pad. We also need some item to motivate the case. So definitely we are calling on all these stakeholders. The media, uh, Joy News, is applauded for that, for what it is doing in making sure that these impact stories are heard across the country and beyond the borders of Ghana. The future of the country depends on these young ones we are reaching out to because the product of what we are seeing now will determine the sustainability of the country in terms of our development. So we believe that if we can equip these young ones, if we can motivate and encourage them, that is the future of our nation. Some of the students had this to say. It's good for them to continue to empower the students. We should make sure that we don't get addicted to drugs and we should learn and study hard so that we can help our country, Ghana. When you're a lady, you have to be careful and be careful of men who are dangerous so that you don't get pregnant as you're a teenager. Precious Semevo Joy News, Sunyai. Auto mechanics in Ghana have been engaging in poor handling of used engine oil, popularly called dirty oil, which uh, contains heavy metals. Improper disposal of used engine oil can lead to heavy metals finding their way into soil, surface water and groundwater. Scientists fear exposure to dirty oil poses long-term risk to their health. Lava from Squissy Deborah has been exploring this topic. At a section of the Swami Magazine enclave in the Ashanti region of Ghana, known as Abawa Wuth, auto mechanic Clement Zuma drains used engine oil. <laughs> With the oil at the brim, Clement can't move it without getting his fingers soiled. The oil is responsible for his stained palms. Clement, who came here a decade ago, has been eating with these hands, sometimes washed, sometimes left to chaperone his meals. Do Christopher would like to don long sleeves to work to limit skin contact with both dirt and oil. He hasn't been spared the discomfort of dirty oil on his skin. Engine oil is a type of lubricant used in automobiles to reduce friction, heat and wear among mechanical parts that are in contact. These oils are chiefly petroleum based or synthetic oils with some additives for improved performance. As a result of its continuous use, the oils become contaminated and therefore must be replaced with fresh engine oil as the used engine oil is no longer functional. Waste oil has been found to contain lead, zinc, arsenic, chromium, cadmium and sulfur. These metals have been found to be harmful to the body. The major organs can be in serious danger when exposed to these metals. Professor Fred Wadu is with the Duke University. First, it can cause cancer. Two, it can cause hypertension. Three, it can cause uh, miscarriages in pregnant women. Four, it causes erectile dysfunction in men. And it's very, very, very potent in that aspect that is well. Uh, uh, scientifically proven that can cause mental depression and two also uh, it causes diminished learning abilities in children. Improper disposal of waste can lead to heavy metals finding their way into soil, surface water and ground water. Unfortunately, pouring used oil on the ground is commonplace, a practice fought to strengthen the soil. As part of efforts to identify and address some public health concerns in Africa, 
the civil engineering department of Duke University in the United States of America have partnered the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology Ghana to understand these practices in order to help the auto mechanics at Swami magazine to deal with them. Professor Fred Bwadu, who is leading the team, has previously researched the presence of these heavy metals in the blood of the auto mechanics where heavy levels of these metals were detected. Uh, Duke University has a very good program, uh, what we call the BAS Connection, where they allow people to do research in various areas. So I did uh, have a grant from BAS Connection, and I came down to look at the uh, heavy metal level contents in the auto mechanics. So we took their uh, fingernails, hair nails, and sorry, fingernails, toenails and hair, and we analyzed for these metals. And we did find out that, uh, or we found out that, uh, depending on the number of years that you work as a mechanic, you have higher metals in your system. So those at younger, uh, uh, smaller years of working here, had lower uh, metal levels, and those with higher um, years of working, like over 12 years, have very high level of metals in them. So that was where the whole thing started, that we thought that the metals um, uh, has a lot to do with the retention in their system. In addition, we also measure the blood pressure and we realize that the higher the metal level content in your system, the higher the blood pressure measurement. So that prompted us to come and do more of uh, educational, uh, health education for the mechanics. Okay, so the students are happy with the interaction with I the auto mechanics. Um, and one thing that I've noticed is that I, I think a lot of them have actually known to some extent that there are some problems that can be caused by um, the motor oil and not wearing protective equipment, but I feel like we're going one step further and helping them further understand the effects that can be caused by this motor oil and the heavy metals. Um, for example, I think a lot of them don't know uh, about exactly all of the problems that can be caused, such as cancer and liver damage. On, uh, uh, on the Joy News channel, we're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Let's take a break when we return this business. Hi, good morning. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The electricity company of Ghana in a bid to guarantee robust and reliable power distribution network is expected to train over 3,000 certified electrical contractors which work, who work for the company. The training which currently focuses on effective earthen system also has other modules targeted at equipping these contractors to ensure safe distribution. Director of ECG Training School, Interma Engineer Ahino Usufi, speaking with Joy Business, said the training is crucial. Here's more. Considered crucial in ensuring safety around any electrical installation or gadgets. The earthen calls by the electricity company of Ghana, ECG, is expected to introduce these contractors who have been training batches to the latest technology and know how in designing and construction of a reliable distribution network. According to Director of ECG Training School in Tema, Engineer Ahin Osu Fuye, by ensuring safety, workers of ECG and contractors do not end up killing themselves, damage any equipment, or cause any distraction. He says, this type of training could be organized once a year, but there are others done every two or three years and refreshes as and when it becomes necessary. Uh, it's very critical because uh, they are part of our workforce. Most of our work are executed by the third third party contractors and if they have to deliver to our standards they have to be trained on what the best practice and what the standards are so giving them the training will give the assurance that they do a good job and that that will ensure that our network uh, also work properly uh, if they are not trained we'll give them work they do work that will not meet our standards and that will impact on our, on our network so basically giving them the competences that we needed to ensure that uh, they deliver to requirements. Lead facilitator and general manager of ECG's Energy Consulting and Telco Business Directorate, Dr. George Edufo says the modular program aims to train the contractors to deliver effective power distribution system for ECG. Dr. Edufo explained that there is system earthing done to protect the power system and equipment earthing to protect gadgets used in homes. If the earthing is not there and you happen to be in contact 
with a gadget, it can be electrocuted. So editing is very key. Now, what we are doing here is that is to equip them with the necessary skill to install a very effective editing. I'll give you an example. We have, if you visit electrical installation, and then the the installation is not properly it. In event of fault, if you happen to be within the premises, you can be killed from what we call a step voltage. Now, the Korea International Cooperation Agency says it will invest $9 million to support the Ghanaian economy. The agency says it is targeting various sectors uh, that will have direct impact on livelihoods as well as contribute largely to economic growth. According to Senior Deputy Country Director Oh Seo Ming, his company is looking at expanding the agric and educational sectors. He spoke to Joy Business at the Korean Knowledge Sharing Seminar at the University of Ghana. Until early 1970s, Korea and Ghana, we had a similar economy and GDP per capita. For now, Ghana GDP per capita is 2,300 US dollars. Korea is about 35,000 US dollars. So we try to make, uh, find uh, like a legion and how we leverage the Korean experience to Ghana by sharing our just partnership. Our partnership, the Republic of Korea, the government of the Republic of Korea, through the Korea International Cooperation Agency, COICA, we made an agreement last year with the University of Ghana. So we will conduct the nine million US dollar the next five years. So today is very remarkable day for launching our new start with the whole University of Ghana faculty and then the students. There are several components we will support. So first of all, we are supporting the Republic of Korea, uh, Republic of Ghana, the government. So we will spend the equipment, the uh, like uh, ICT equipment, about like uh, 1.5 million US dollar, and about 4.5 million US dollar. The we will. Uh, Spend for the construction, four stories, the 2,500 square meter building, and then 2.2 million US dollar we will spend for the startup incubation program. All right, and that's it for business. The news continues after this break. Do stay tuned. Welcome back to the rest of our story. Small people are resorting to trekking as Agunan Kwantatakwa, the highway, has become impassable. The road, which has deteriorated over the years without proper maintenance, is causing long trailers to break down frequently on it, resulting in the buildup of huge vehicular traffic on that stretch. My colleague Samuel Kojubrais is monitoring uh, things for us there. He joins us via Zoom with uh, some live updates. Kojubrais, how uh, dangerous uh, and deteriorated is this stretch? Well, I, I think it, it, it's uh, beyond description. The road has really deteriorated to the point that it will take um, you know, a massive construction to get the road back on track and all back to the state where the vehicles will have a smooth you know, drive on it. Now, as we speak, there are two portions of this road that have been blocked, and it takes some smart driving for smaller cars to bypass it because two long trailer vehicles have locked up at St. Uh, Mary um, on the stretch when you're getting to Apama. When you are able to cross it, there, there are also two long trailer vehicles that have also blocked the road at Ewusiejo. So when you cross this one, you get to Ewusiejo and you are not able to pass. I've met people who say, They've gotten close to El Cedro. They want to get to Aguna, but because they are not able to cross the huge traffic, they have to return to Takrade. Now, I'm here with one man who's been walking from Takrade to this point. He says he's going to Apoma Chief. How is that? I'm fine, thank you. Why did you choose to walk? Because the road, you learned that the road is broad. You learned that the road is broad. Yeah. That's why I'm walking from Takrade to Apoma. 
How many minutes have you been walking? Uh, about 30 minutes now. Well, I, I shall. So, um, he, he had to resort to trekking, and, and I've seen a lot of people who are walking as well because if you don't walk, you'll be stuck in traffic. Some said they've been stuck in traffic for two hours. Uh, some say they've been uh, stuck in traffic for an hour. And, and everybody and his or her story, it's, it's quite a hectic situation here. If you want to move from Takadi to Agunan Kwanta, it may take you not know, less than four hours for you to cross because of uh, the way the traffic is. I've had people tell me they had to walk from Bokro to um, Apawa, which is, which is about, it would take you no less than one hour, 30 minutes walking to get there. But that's how the situation is. If you don't walk, it will be difficult for you to cross with your vehicle. So um, what we are asking is for government to take a real look at this because day in, day out, there are huge mineral resources that are held on this road. And they cannot fathom why such an important road is left to deteriorate to the level where vehicles that have to park on it get stuck in traffic for hours, losing man hours. One businessman called me this morning and said his workers, as at 10 a.m., had not got into the office. So just imagine the hours they're losing in traffic, Isa. Samuel, could you brace uh, on that stretch? bringing us uh, updates on how deteriorated that stretch has become. And that's how we wrap up the bulletin this morning. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. You can log on to myjournalline.com. Over there you'll find uh, stories and updates of all the developing stories. One of them, NCA Kickstarts Digital Audio Broadcasting Trial in Accra in Kumasi in August. You will find a number of the stories, or uh, top stories on uh, myjohnline.com. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. See you again at 12.